Would you still love him if he was broke? What does that even mean? That's a weird question, right? I'm gonna be honest with you, I've been pondering it for a while and I think it gets more confusing the more I ponder it. I think that's because I have more questions before I answer. Who's the he and can they be a they? And what's broke mean? Is that paycheck to paycheck or I have student loan but I'm making 80K or is that I'm making 30K or is that I literally have zero dollars in my bank account? Why do people ask this question? Would you still love him even if he was broke? They're asking something but what is it they're asking. Or maybe they're trying to prove something to you. I had no reason not to trust him. Or maybe they're just trying to warn you away from a scrub. Ladies, stop dating broke men. I don't think you should date losers. Walk away forever. There is a difference between somebody who won't make any money and somebody who refuses to make any money for any part of their life. Would you still love him even if he was broke? Is the he the 15 year old boy you've been dating for three months in high school? Or is the he a 45 year old actor who part time works on a sitcom and part time waits tables? So when you were that Hooters waitress, did you ever think you would wind up at the Golden Globes red carpet and pretty much being nominated for every award there is? No, no, I never did. I was waiting tables in Maui and working at a restaurant, li living in a van, and uh, the director uh, director came in, I was at my table, and she said, hey, you're cute, do you act? I was like, yeah, I act, you should put me in a movie. <laughs> and then uh, four days later, I was in Los Angeles. I used to work at uh, Red Lobster, I used to work at Red Lobster, I used to scrape shrimp in the garbage cans and then load up the dishwasher. Is the he a grown man who after leaving Harvard Law ended up paying off his student loans basically just before he became president? Didn't you just pay off your loans in 2004? Yeah, 2000, it basically the year I was elected to Senate, the year before I became a U.S. Senator was when we uh, when we finished paying off uh, all of our loans. Or is it a 55 year old man who's basically lived off his parents his whole life, never had to get a job, and after they died, they left him their house, so he never even had to do that. He is no good for you. The he in question is very important because when you date somebody, this will change your expectation of their behavior. If you've been with someone since they were 15, you're gonna have a different expectation of them than if you meet somebody when you're in your 50s. The expectation of accomplishment will be different. Now more than this, they're gender, their disability status, their neurotypical versus neurodivergent status will all play a role in judgment. Every cultural bubble has an expectation of behavior that differs from one to another. In some bubbles, the expectation of behavior can even change if you're the eldest daughter or eldest son to the youngest child involved. This question would be worded differently in my bubble. In my bubble, they wouldn't ask you if you'd still love him if he was broke. They'd ask you, would you still love him if he never got his life together? The world is full of dreamers we dream of an ideal romantic relationship in which when we marry this person, our life gets way better. So not only does it matter when you meet your person, but the type of lifestyle you dream of also plays a role. There are different relationship models you can choose from in life, or you can make up your own. Number two is Shane's thoughtfulness. He is very thoughtful. This was from the you know, literal first day that we ever knew each other. It is the thing that sticks out about him most. Every time I would come to visit, he would, <laughs> I would show up to his parents' house and there would be a giant pile of snacks, all my favorite snacks on the bed. I would be visiting for like one night and there'd be this huge mound of food that I might enjoy. You know, he would really go out of his way to make sure that I, you know, knew that he cared about me. And he still does that today, whether I'm folding laundry and he's, you know, offering to sit there and make me laugh while I'm doing it. Or if I don't feel well and he, is ordering food all day long. You know, <laughs> there's a lot of food parts, long. but I'm just saying, <laughs> Shane always goes out of his way to make sure that I, you know, am taken care of. But some of the most common known ones are dinks, double income, no kids. If you choose this relationship model, you're gonna need to both work and specifically probably both have careers. See, double income, no kids is usually a celebrated relationship style that involves two usually high earners who work together to combine income to have a pretty relaxed life. This relationship can be stressful in one or two ways, but for the most part, works out pretty well. One of the ways that I've seen it not work out is when you have two opposite working schedules. Though there are no children, there's still no time to have intimacy or connection and usually the relationship fizzles out. So being a divorce attorney has actually significantly improved my outlook on marriage. Before I started doing this work, I had no clue what makes a marriage work. I thought that it was either luck or people were just stuck in these really unhappy marriages because that's all that I saw. 
But in the last 10 years, what I've noticed is that people are getting divorced for the same reasons over and over and over again. And they're not usually related to money or cheating. It's usually contempt and resentment that's built up over time. One of the other relationship models that I really do like was based off of a couple I met in my 20s. I met this really successful woman with a degree who had a husband who stayed home. And when I asked her, why does your husband stay home? She said, oh, he suffers from an anxiety disorder and he can't seem to leave the house. And at the time, I was quite shocked by this as I knew disability would be one of the reasons people wouldn't choose them as a partner. But since they were in love with each other and they were both good people, him having a disability didn't really impact the relationship. He made it work to the best of his ability and I think that's kind of key here. So while she worked outside of the home, he maintained everything inside of the home. And this was about team building. They both worked their hardest to make the team succeed. Now, years later, he did get help for his anxiety and was able to get a job outside the home, though part-time, it still helped contribute to the household. Now, of course, based off of your goals, you might have a stay-at-home parent situation in which, let's say, traditionally the man would work and the woman would stay home and she would take care of the kids. In some situations, there are even relationships in which the man works and the woman stays home with no children. Or in some situations, you might even see some memes about women making $300,000 a year and their men wearing aprons at home being the perfect stay-at-home husband. Now, of course, there are monogamous, polyamorous, open relationships. There are relationships with they, them, gender fluidity, queer relationships. It really depends on the person and it really depends on the structure you're aiming for. So this question, would you still love him if he was broke, isn't really asking it, would you love him if he didn't make money? The question is really, would you love him if he was a bum? And the answer I hope should be, even if I love a bum, I'm not gonna marry him. I believe in order to have a successful relationship, you have to marry a good person and you have to be a good person. And then you have to treat each other with kindness and love and dedication. And you have to have a compatibility when it comes to values. So if you're dating somebody who's a bum, does that mean your values say that being a bum is good or tolerable? Is that saying that you're willing to be with somebody who is a bum because you're a bum? What does it mean to date somebody who's not contributing? And again, contribution in my eyes has nothing to do with money. It has to do with making the team win. Stay-at-home mothers who do not make any money are still contributing to the household. Stay-at-home partners who are caring for disabled partners are still contributing to the household. We are all contributing to our households whether we bring in money or not. Now, one of the ways to know if you're dating a bum or somebody who's actually contributing to the relationship is let's say you get sick now you can't go to work what do they do they get a job they contribute they find a way because the idea isn't that they refuse to make money the idea is that they don't need to make money because you make enough it's great wasn't that amazing yeah she get in there and make mama a sandwich okay it's because he wouldn't need to work but he would need to still contribute to the household it's not about gender it's about love compatibility and contribution it's about making sure you don't take advantage of each other even if you're a parent and a child and your child lives at home, they shouldn't take advantage of their parents. You shouldn't take advantage of people. And if you're willing to do that, especially to someone you claim to love, I think that says something about your character. Your character is what we are interested in. How do you know somebody has a good character? Dr. K has a great stream about this where he actually explains to his audience that his wife kind of dated him when he wasn't at his best. And even in my own life, I know my wife certainly had a red flag or two. I was basically like a whole parade. I was like addicted to video games, failing out of college, no job after two years, being supported by my girlfriend, was going nowhere very rapidly in life. And yet we're still like happily married with two kids and we've been together for like almost 20 years at this point. And so how does that work? Because there's this idea that if there's a red flag in a relationship, you should just dump them and run. So it turns out that when there's a red flag early on in a relationship, it leads to problems. And generally speaking, we think problems in relationships are bad, right? But if you look at what leads to successful relationships over time, it is the ability to navigate through problems. And so one really interesting thing happens in red flags in early relationships. If you voice this problem to your partner one month in, two months in, three months in, then you get to know something that's very, very important that will indicate the long-term health or illness of a relationship, which is how do we navigate problems? And what I've seen in just about all of my patients is when there was a problem early on the, in the relationship, these two people either decide then and there, okay, are we like willing to work through this? Do we have the skills to work through it? Do we have the desire to work through it? And then you kind of navigate in that relationship. You're sort of stress testing the relationship with a red flag really early on, and then that leads to actually very good prognostic signs. 
you know, in my case, I sort of got my life together when my my wife, uh, girlfriend was like, you know, hey, like this is not working. This is the way I can support you. This is what I need to do. And could I swallow my pride and actually make an effort to change for the sake of this person? And so the really interesting thing is that red flags basically stress test our problem solving capability, which is a really, really good prognostic factor for a successful relationship long term. Because if you've got someone who's got a red flag and they're willing to actually change, that's someone that you may actually want to spend the rest of your life with. But how did she know he would live up to his potential? I think it's because she wasn't living for the potential based off fantasy, but a potential based off character. Dr. K's character was clear. So his potential was clear. But if somebody has a bad character, then their potential is a fantasy if it goes beyond their character. I think often in life we end up with scrubs or losers because we live for the potential based off of our fantasy. But if you took away the fantasy and you base their potential off their character, I think it's pretty clear whether or not they're going to be a bum or whether or not they're gonna to contribute to the household. Contributing to the household is a team effort. It is not a singular person's responsibility to do all of the labor, emotional or financial. So that question, would you love him even if he was broke, is a good question, and I think it's meant to deter you from dating a scrub. But I think you really need to make sure that you're not reading it in a superficial manner and thinking, oh, I wouldn't date him, he only makes 30K, or I wouldn't date him, he makes no money. Oh, I wouldn't date him because of this. It's not about the money. It's about character. All of these dating gurus and relationship people and all these people giving advice, they're always trying to get you to settle in relationships. Um, so should I just keep waiting for the economy to crash or is there never gonna be a time where I'm gonna be able to afford shit again? Everybody may- <laughs> It's the classic. <laughs> this guy's got an excellent point, but back to the chick who's like, I'll never be able to afford anything ever again. Um, I'm sorry, but if I was even a remotely decent looking woman, even like just baseline borderline, uh, I'm sorry, but you can basically lock down a guy, lower your fucking standards, and he will provide for you. Remember the friend I said earlier who wanted to play house with 60K a year and be big daddy on 60K? Plenty of men that will do that for you. So, ladies, that's a cheat code for you. Us guys, we kind of don't really have that. Unless you're just like Giga Chad or, you know, you're fucking slick Ricky Aioli. You know, which most guys aren't. So, that's not going to work. But, ladies, seriously. I I'm honestly kind of getting shocked with the amount of women that um, just can't go lock down a dude and just fucking live with them. Uh, it's it's kind of baffling. Us guys, we could see a homeless woman on, those, on the road with, with potential and we go... Yeah, yeah, just take her in. I clean her up a little bit. I go, I could see the final product. It's not that hard. <laughs> Good God. Sex in the city, right? This is not love. This is not compatibility. This isn't good. And I think it's bad because it means you usually have to maintain some level of dishonesty with the person that you're with because nobody wants to hear you settled for them. So if you did settle for somebody and you never told them, that's kind of lying by omission. Now, if you told that person to their face, I settled for you and you settled for me and we're just going to be companions throughout life, that's fine. But this idea that we should lie to people, that we should settle with people for their money or their bodies or their looks or how many kids they can give us, that's fine in an evolutionary sense. But since I think we're higher thinking creatures than our base evolution, I think that means we can strive for something greater. The core problem today is not a lack of money. Now money's helpful, money's good. But I've watched him, I've watched him on two or three different occasions say, if you're not rich, you're either a fool or you're lazy. Only a fool would say that. Andrew Tate is a fool. My dad wasn't a fool and my dad dang sure wasn't lazy, but he wasn't rich either because he didn't live his life for himself and he did not extort people and use people. He did not get on the backside of internet somewhere with women and take people for their money. He served people, so he died poor. So any jack wagon that gets on the internet with his shirt off and calls men like my dad and men like you have probably known your whole life either lazy or fools because they're not crooked and degenerate like Andrew Tate is, because they're not rich, the man's a fool. And why in the world would you follow a fool? A loud, arrogant fool. Now you say he's rich. <laughs> 
Hollis, there's a lot of thieves out there that are rich. If you don't want to strive for something greater, then I think you should continue to settle. Again! But this question, would you love him if he was broke? It really should be, would you love him if he was a bad person? Would you stay with him if he was a bad person? Would you be with them if they were a bad person? If the answer is yes, look in a mirror. If the answer is no, then prove that with your action. Because plenty of people are out here settling for marriages in which at least they get a paycheck or at least they get a hot young woman. It's superficial and shallow and it is absolutely contributing to the divorce rate. What's your advice to men these days? You see these women advocating for divorce. You coach a lot of men. You know, you said, I'm married to the game, right? So what's your advice for the average dude out there that's looking to have a pretty woman in his life? Should he get married? Should he never get married? How do you raise kids? What's your best approach? Well, one, I say to that lady who was talking, misery loves company. So, you know, nobody wants to be single and divorced by themselves. Exactly. And as far as dudes, exactly. You should never get married. There's no benefit to a man to get married. If you can tell me one, you can tell me one. If one of these ladies wants to give me a benefit for the man, but there's no benefit for a man to get married. Instead, it benefits the woman more, so there's really no point. You know, you could leave me, you could cheat on me, regardless of this paper, so why do we need it? So if you leave, you could take half of what I have. So it's really just not a smart business decision. Men, especially since a lot of podcasts like this have popped up, these conversations happen, and I'm friends with a lot of the guys that do this, they say, listen, why? It makes no sense for a guy, especially a successful guy, right? You know, I have a lot of buddies that are married, successful guys. Now they've been married 10 years. They're, they got married in their early 30s. They're in their early 40s now. We're starting to see some divorce start to occur. Everybody is so worried about the divorce rate, but nobody can figure out why. I just, I can't, I have too much to lose. You know, I would love to be with you forever. I just, I can't do it. I want to be with you. I just can't actually do the paperwork. What would you say? I'm fine with that. If we have the whole lifestyle, like living together with kids and a party to celebrate our love, and it's pure like that, I'm totally fine with that. I'm not dependent on a man, really, for, for like You'd anything be... financial. I can take care of myself. So if we're like naturally and organically coming together, I'm completely fine with that yeah, lifestyle. Yeah, but that's easy to say when you don't have kids, sweetheart. Of course, when you well, pop out two, three kids, you're not going to be like, listen, I don't need a man. I can take care of myself. No. You're literally going to be taking care of the kids. Well, we'll yeah, have I, a, I, I would assume not. another like, kind of agreement that we're 50-50 responsible for the children. Okay, so there is an agreement now. Yeah, but we're not talking about a marriage contract, right? Again! Everybody is so worried about the divorce rate, but nobody can figure out why. Because you're shallow. You think it's about women being promiscuous. I look for a woman that's not promiscuous. So you think it's about men making money. Okay. But one thing about me, I could pull 100000 out of the bank. And now he's... Now we got to go for me for 10000 This dude's a fraudster. It's about you. You are the one contributing to people continuing to settle. Every time a couple settles, harmony dies, symbiosis dies, real communication dies. Settling might have built all of civilization, but all of civilization now needs an upgrade. At this point, it should be pretty clear that there's a difference between a broke boy who's a bomb, a person who's going to take advantage of you, and a person who's truly gonna make it work with you. Making it work is a combination of shared values and love. It's about sharing a life with a consciousness that you truly see and feel seen by. As much as the internet shares a negative when it comes to romantic relationships, there is absolutely a positive. When did you first know that you were in love with each other? <laughs> um, so <laughs> I knew that I was first in love. It was like a year and a half into our relationship and we were visiting his family for the first time. That was like the moment that I was like, okay, I definitely think I want to marry this guy. It was, I guess, what, like a month or two into our relationship. Uh, she got a job offer in Florida. I didn't even think like, oh, I guess we're not going to be together. I just thought like, all right, well, I guess you have to do long distance. I traveled 8,356 miles to visit her in South Africa. That's when I knew. I said, I'm getting on a plane and I'm going to see this For one. three days. She was there for, for three, three days. days. I didn't know at the same time, which is very no. unfair. <laughs> uh, I knew when I understood that I had to make a decision. I was still like, okay, I got somebody here, somebody there. Like, I had to make a choice. And I was like, wow, I don't want to lose her. I love her and I don't want to lose her. And that was when I knew. Everyone says, oh, you'll just, when you see it, you'll know. And you go, oh, shut up. But, oh my, like, there it was. <laughs> it was that, it was that clear. Knew it Im immediately. Yeah, it took us three days to say, okay, we need to, <laughs> this is it. we need to figure out a way that yeah. we're going to be in the same place. <laughs> I think the first time I knew I was in love with him is um, when I thought to myself, when he's finished with doing what he's doing, he's gonna be hungry. And 
I need to cook something for him. So, and I was like, whoa, where did, where did that come from? After graduating college, I ended up going back to Georgia uh, to hang out with my mom and figure out what I want to do next in my life. And I was there maybe two weeks and the entire time I just kept thinking about Amber. So I ended up going back to North Carolina and on the drive up that way, I was that's when it hit me. It's like, man, I'm, I'm really, I think I love her. Susan walked by and I go, wow. <laughs> And I saw him with this big smile on his face, so I thought, hmm. And when he said to me, look, I don't want to date anybody else. I don't have time or energy for it, and I only want to date you. It was like, oh, isn't that terrific? How many guys are like that, you know, that, this soon? I think I kind of knew for a long time. I think I did too, actually. Yeah. But I remember when I was in eighth grade, I told my mom that I was going to marry Abe, and she... <laughs> I don't think she was expecting it. We were driving and she kind of screeched to a stop and she was like, what? <laughs> you know, we shared the same, I guess, values, the same uh, family uh, connections, etc. And, you know, you know, her mother was born in Italy and my parents were Italian. So, you know, we thought, well, I guess there's some connection here. So would you still love him if he was broke? I sincerely hope not. Thank you.